morning. My name is Bruce Moore from the East Long Meadow Historical Commission. We're going to be doing a video today about sandstone quarrying in East Long Meadow, Massachusetts. Our first photo depicts the town seal designed in 1994 by Sheila Osgood. It depicts the train station down at Maple Street where all the stone was shipped from in other various parts of the quarrying industry in town. Our first photo is from around 1880 and it shows some of the earlier operations of the quarrying industry in town. There's a bed of stone down about 30 feet below ground. There's a gentleman standing on top of the stone and all that overburden on top had to be removed before they got to the stone. At the base of the picture you'll see an ox cart with stone ready to be taken down to the stone yard. And there's also a bunch of men standing on top of the bed of rock. They're working up above that too. The next photo shows an unknown quarry, possibly the Taylor Quarry in East Long Meadow and there's a team of oxen down near the derrick and a bunch of stone cutters on the right side of the picture. I think they came over from where they were working just to pose for the photo. They wouldn't have been working there on the rocks. And to the left of the ox cart you'll see um, it's one of three different styles of derricks we're going to see today. This one is a hand crank derrick. The gentleman standing there has got the crank in his hand and that would raise and lower the boom. The big tall part of the derrick is the mast and the part that moves is called the boom. So he would be able to move that and raise and lower it to drop the stone down onto the ox cart. You'll see a lot of water in the bottom of this photo. That was a big problem in town and it plagued a lot of the quarry so much so that they had to shut them down because they couldn't pump it out at this time. So the gentlemen to the left of the derrick are working on a ledge that they are able to get some stone out of. This is a very early photo probably from the 1880s of a very primitive type of operation at the quarry in the foreground you'll see a circular path and there's a horse on the outer part of the path going around in a circle and there's a gentleman standing inside the hole in the ground and there's a drum next to him that the cable wrapped around and by moving the horse around in a circular fashion they could raise and lower the cables on the derrick if you a close up of the derrick will show that there's a stone right on it right now being able to getting ready to be put on the ox cart and the top part of the photo it looks like the boss standing there on the hill kind of just overseeing the operation we're not sure where this one was taken but it could have been somewhere like pine quarry where your the lay of the land goes downhill like that but it's just a wonderful old photo shows how the stone used to be taken out. This is a series of two photos taken from the 1944 history book. At that time they weren't sure where they were taken so they're just an unknown quarry at this point. The first one shows a gentleman on top of a rock. He's standing on top of the steam drill. He'd be drilling holes down vertically and the gentleman down below will be working on taking the stone out vertically in the second picture. You'll see this long channel behind the men standing there. That's the width of the block they're trying to get out of there. They put wedges in there to split the rock horizontally and then took it out in chunks. This is a series of six photos 
taken by the Howes brothers in 1901. They went around town taking photos of homes in various quarries in town. This is the Billings Quarry on Summers Road across from the police station. It's filled with water now uh, where Danny Burak lives. But this shows the all-Swedish crew at work down in the quarry. There's a set of tracks down at the bottom of the quarry, and they ran across Summers Road into a swamp. About It actually went about 700 feet across the road. You can still see the, the bed there just beyond the entrance to where the dump is going south. And the reason they put those tracks in there was that there was so much overburden that had to come off that they could put it in the carts and just truck it across the street to the swamp to get rid of it. This photo is also on the 1969 town seal. This is a close-up of the same quarry, just showing you the derricks in operation. This is a wonderful photo of the actual operations. If you look at the top of this photo, you'll see probably eight or ten feet of real lousy stone on top. That's overburden that had to come off. Then you've got a decent bed of stone. And then where the gentlemen are standing here, you'll see another three or four feet of real lousy stone. And the gentlemen at the very bottom are into a fantastic bed of stone right now. These vertical lines that you see in the middle of the photo are from a steam drill. They drill down at exact intervals and split the stone on a vertical basis. And these gentlemen at the bottom standing on the boards are driving their wedges with sledgehammers into the bed of stone and they'll be taking those blocks of stone off and taking them out with the derricks. This is a famous hats on photo of the crew at the Billings Quarry. This is the hats off photo of the same gentleman at the quarry. This gentleman in the vest was the foreman. His name was Algot Carlson. This gentleman to his left was Arthur Anderson's father. And this is an all Swedish crew. Many of these gentlemen are related to each other. You can see a resemblance in their facial features. Looks like a very jovial bunch of men. Here they are standing next to a pile, the same pile of rocks they were just posing next to. This derrick is located on Summers Road where the llama farm was. It's just to the right of Danny Burak's driveway. The foundation for the derrick is still there. You can see that from the road. But these guys are just posing for the camera. Most everybody loved to do that. This is a photo of the Garfield quarry where Spade Arden is now. It's also a 1901 Howes Brothers photo. In the very background, you'll see the top of the Congregational Church, so you'll get an idea of where you are in proximity to the center. There's a big block of stone hoisted up in the air here, and the crew is standing around the derrick, posing for the camera. These are cables going over to the steam engine house that's not viewed at this particular time. There's gentlemen down in the quarry working also. Looks like a real nice bed of stone here too. This is a photo of the John Street quarry up near where Four Corners is. This white building in the background was the schoolhouse at Four Corners where Forest Area Smith Funeral Home is. It's up now, it's been moved up to where Center School used to be, and we call it the Little Red School House now, but it was painted white at the time. This was a very shallow quarry here. They didn't have to remove any overburden. The stone was right on top, so it made for easy digging 
for these gentlemen. This is a close-up of some of the crew at work here. This quarry, when it was abandoned, became a dump and later was filled in with soil and homes are built on top of that now. This is a couple of photos of the Worcester quarry on Summers Road taken around 1912. They were made as postcards by the Norcross brothers. This is where Brownstone Gardens is now and it's filled with water but it shows the quarry in operation at the time. This is a photo of the same quarry. You can see three derricks in operation and this house with the long chimney on it is the steam engine house that powered the derricks. This is a close-up of that steam engine house. And they also had to pump the water out of here all the time. This is a picture of the Taylor Quarry taken around 1880 near the DPW yard now. This house in the left corner is still there right opposite High Street on Summers Road. Most of this was filled in right now and the town yard is, um, they use that for their service area. This is a photo of an unknown quarry in East Longmeadow their gentlemen are standing next to the derrick on top of a large pier. All the stone from the area has been quarried out and they used the leftover stone to make this giant pier and mounted the derrick on top of that so they could get the stone from down below. The stone on top is stone that they're going to be taking out to the stone yard. This stone to the left is all leftover stuff they don't need anymore. Nowadays they'd grind that up and use it for landscaping material but at the time they had no use for it so they just put it into a hole that they didn't use anymore. This is a close-up of the gentleman standing next to the derrick. You can see how huge this derrick is. It's probably as wide as one of the gentlemen themselves. It's probably 60 or 70 feet tall and made out of chestnut and the engine house is in the background. This is a beautiful 1901 photo of the Howes brothers took of the Kibbe quarry on Kibbe Road. There was three quarries there working at the same time. D different outfits worked at various ends of the quarries. They're in a beautiful bed of stone down below here. This is mostly the rock drilling crew here. You'll see in the next photo a close-up of them. That's the gentleman standing on the rock drilling machine that drilled the holes vertically. I love this ladder here. I'm sure OSHA wouldn't approve of that right now, but it certainly worked at the time. This is a 1901 Howes Brothers photo, of the, also of one of the Kibbe quarries. These gentlemen here in the front were lifelong friends. That's Mr. Runquist on the right. He's 51 years old. And these two gentlemen to his left are the Rystedt brothers. Uh, Mr. Runquist has a son and grandson that are plumbers in East Long Meadow. You've probably had work done by some of them at your house. This is a photo of the same quarry a little further back. The gentlemen are just posing with their tools. Mr. Runquist on the right is holding a, a long-handled pickaxe and this gentleman on the left is holding a shorter one. They, they use the pickaxes to start holes for the drilling operator and also when the rocks came out of the ground they put a hole on each side so they could be lifted out. A device like a giant ice tong would grab the rock plus a, 
a chain also and they were able to lift them out of the ground like that. This is f the same quarry. You're looking further up in the photo at the steam derrick. These are cables that are running to the engine house. The next picture will show a picture of the actual engine house. And this gentleman is inside the steam engine house working the derrick, making it go up and down. He's got mechanisms inside there that can make the wire go out. And he has a brake on that drum that goes around here where he can just have total control of the whole thing. You don't want to have any accidents with the, the um, derrick. This is about a 1915 photo of a unknown crew of quarry workers. That's Mr. Algot Carlson again. He's a little bit older looking now. This possibly might be a can of black powder. This Mr. Carlson was an expert at determining how much black powder to put in each hole to crack the blocks out. And that's mostly a Swedish crew here also. This gentleman in the top hat is Mr. William Son. This is around 1895 with his 10-man crew, probably on the Kibbe Road quarry. He was one of the three operators of that quarry where the town dump is, and he also ran the quarry further up Kibbe Road. We called Hoover's Quarry, where we all swam in. This is a beautiful 1884 photo of a group of quarry workers. When we first got the photo, it was split right in the middle, right across the 1884. It was on hard cardboard, and Bruce Atkinson spent a couple hours repairing the photo and cleaning it up, and it really came out beautiful. You'd hardly tell there was any damage to it. But each one of these gentlemen is holding the tools of their trade. This would be the foreman here with the hat on to the left. This would be the water boy in the middle. All these gentlemen are holding pickaxes up top and these gentlemen in the middle would be holding pry bars. They're just, it's a wonderful photo and, and an unknown quarry, unfortunately. A lot of our photos don't have any information on the back. This is a photo of Frank Champlin's operation on South Main Street near where Jim and Sandy Davis lived. They had five homes built out up there. And he supplied the horses and wagons for the quarries. He owned 32 horses and had his own blacksmith shop on the property. And they built all the wagons there. So the Teamsters would come up to their yard every day and hitch up their horses and head off to the various quarries in town. This is a close-up of the teams heading off to work. This is a wonderful photo of Mr. Frank Goodrich coming through the center of town. Right behind that telephone pole in the trees is the old Methodist church on the corner of Elm Street. It's hard to see it there, but I think he's just come down Summers Road and he's headed off to the stone yard. You can see the size of these giant wheels here, the wood wheels there, how massive they are. And that was all constructed by Mr. Champlin. And this is an eight horse team here, so you can see it was a lot of work to get all this stone to the stone yards. This is a wonderful photo of Clifton Smith coming out of the McGregory Quarry. It's now Ronald Lane off of South Bend Lane. It used to be Summers Road there, but they reconfigured it in the 50s, and now it's just a dead-end street. But This wall behind him 
is still there and the opening in front of the horses is still there so we were able to determine where that photo was taken. It's virtually unchanged since the 1800s. That's one of the oldest quarries in town also. This is a very famous photo of George Patrick posing on his team of oxen in front of the where the DPW is right now. That was the Taylor Stone Yard at the time. He's also on the town seal and they made a postcard of him that was passed around and mailed to many people in town. It's probably hard to tell but on the tips of the horns of these oxen there's little brass round pieces put on the end. I'm sure when they put the yokes on these animals they were a little bit unruly and they didn't want to get gored by their horns. We actually have one of these ox yokes down at the museum that was donated by the Turnbergs. It was found at the town yard several years ago. This is also another photo of Mr. Frank Goodrich on Maple Street going to the stone yard. This building to the right was the Hun block at the time and the building there now, this left corner would be where Boston Market is. The building in the middle background is where Sticks and Stones lacrosse store is. It also used to be Nooney's Hardware. You can see the top of the Congregational Church in the background. This is a photo of some stone samples offered for sale by the Norcross brothers. It shows the three shades of stone they were offering for sale. This top one is bright red taken from the Maynard Quarry up behind Graziano Gardens on Elm Street. St. Michael's Church was built with that. It's one of the only bright red stones in the whole world. The middle photo is from the Kibbe Quarry on Kibbe Road. The town hall is built from that stone. That was built in 1882. It looks as beautiful today as it was then. The third stone at the bottom is the Worcester Stone. It was ca called the Worcester Quarry after the Norcross brothers bought it. They came down from Worcester. So they just named it the Worcester Quarry. Uh, the Berkshire Bank on Shaker Road is made from that stone, just to give you an idea of the where it was used in town here. This is a, a letterhead from James and Mara, one of the owners of some quarries in town. They were actually located on Lyman Street in Springfield and they employed two to three hundred men. All the stone that they took out of East Long Meadow went directly to their Springfield office. So on Lyman Street down near the railroad station so they didn't actually dress any of the stone here in town but they certainly were very active in town they owned the Billings Quarry and one of the pine quarries and had many other operations in town here this is a letterhead from Frank Burton he's offering crane red sandstone for sale the crane quarry was located right behind where Rocky's hardware is now. There was two quarries there, the Cope quarry and the crane quarry. They filled with water after they were done being used and the kids used to fish in there. And they've since been filled in and paved over, so they're no longer around. That was the fate of many of the quarries in town. They either became a dump or just got filled in. This is a, a 1900 photo of the Norcross brothers working at the mill off of Maple Street down behind where community feed was. A um, hundred or more men worked and lived here. This particular worker, uh, the second one from the end, his left hand appears to have some kind of an old injury to it. I'm sure 
that was a common occurrence working with this stone for fingers to get crushed and other various assortment of injuries. This gentleman in the vest would be the foreman. He'd be more or less in control over all the guys you see here. This is a photo of the traveling crane at the Norcross stone yard. Made entirely of wood and you could see the mill and the offices in the background. This is a close-up of the traveling crane. This board on top tra traversed on these parallel tracks here. You can see a stone in mid-air being ready to be loaded onto a cart here. And then they just take the cart and bring it over to the railroad tracks and await awaiting to be shipped out. There was as many as seven or eight trains a day came in to take the stone away and one of the trains had 17 carloads of stone at one time. They, they picked up stone here and also at the Rankin yard on the other side of Maple Street. We'll show a picture of that. This is a photo of the new steel traveling crane at the Norcross Mill around 1915. The old wooden one had burned. This one was now electrically powered with power generated at Palmer Mass. They had five gang saws here in operation for cutting the stone. This is a beautiful photo of the John Rankin stone processing plant on Crane Avenue. You're looking south. There's two derricks in operation here. And you can see the steam engine house where this stack is. There's steam coming out of the side of the building there under a lot of pressure that operated the derricks. This would be one of the flat cars that they'd use to load the stone onto to get onto the rail cars. And this is the demise of the Rankin Mill. This is around 1915. The brownstone industry dwindled dramatically at this time. These are limestone blocks from Indiana around the outsides of the building. There was a quarry strike around 1900 where the workers wanted to go from 23 cents to 25 cents an hour and the quarry owners refused to grant the raise so it kind of broke the back of the quarry industry and the next few years they just spent using the stone that they had on hand. This is where home lumber is also or, or excuse me home lumber is out of business but this is exactly where there that is located. This is a series of three photos of the stone cutting yard where the DPW is now located. This photo was taken around 1889 and shows some of the specialty items that they made there. This is at the Taylor Quarry site. In the foreground here you'll see these beautiful spindles that they made. They look like they were turned on a lathe. And each one of these sheds has a door that goes up and down. The stone cutters are in each one of these sheds at work here. This is another photo of the same cutting yard. There's stones in the foreground that are ready to be shipped out. And they just used a smaller derrick here to move the rocks from each place where they needed to go to. Here's some of the stone cutters posing during a break in the action. This is a picture of the stone cutters at work at the Taylor Quarry around the 1880s. This gentleman in the middle has got an odd emblem on his shirt. It looks like an anchor in the middle and then I'm not sure what that other drawing is around it. If anyone has any ideas about that, we'll be glad to 
if we could figure out what it means, that would be great. I don't know if he might have been a merchant marine or what exactly he was. But these are all stone cutters here with their tools in hand. This is a close up of one of the workers here. He's got his mallet in one hand and a chisel in the other hand. And what he's working on is called a sandbox. That would have been filled with sand and they could put the piece inside of that so just to keep it stable. They're, they're still used today. This gentleman's got his mallet as does this stone cutter and then you get a little better view of that emblem of that other gentleman. You can see all the rock dust on the ground there from where they've been working. This is a photo of some of the stone cutters hard at work taking a break. Another photo of the stone cutters Many of these guys died in their 40s or early 50s at the latest from breathing the dust, the silica dust from the stone. They got what's called stone cutters consumption. We would call it something like emphysema today, but they were the highest paid people in the quarry industry outside the owners. But unfortunately, a lot of them died at an early age. This gentleman is a very key figure in the quarry industry. He's the blacksmith. He's hard at work on his an with his anvil here making some tools. I think in the foreground you can see some of the quarry chisels and stuff he's made here, but every one of the quarries had a blacksmith on hand there to sharpen their tools and make new tools. It was just everybody dependent on him for every day stuff being done. This is a group of some of the hand forged steel quarry tools that that blacksmith would have made. These big hammers with the teeth in them are called crandling hammers. They put a designs on the stones. This would be one of the actual mallets they used to go along with the chisels. They're usually made of beech wood. And this is one of the pickaxes that they made. You can see how incredibly sharp they are. They needed to be, you know, to a real sharp point so they could start the holes in the rock and clear off debris from the ends, etc. The bottom photo shows some of the chisels that they made. Every one of these has the person's name on it that owned it at the time. They were pretty valuable tools, so they all stamped their names on them. This next series of five pictures was taken August 16th in 1937 by Victor Mazzarella, who was 16 years old. He was working at the concession stand at Redstone Lake. A 1937 Hudson Terraplane went to the bottom of the quarry when the park and brake let go. And after a while they had they sent a team of divers down to get the car out. You can see children in the background watching him get ready to put on his diving helmet and go down and get the car. Here he is with his helmet on getting ready to go down underwater. And he's got his cables winched onto the bumper of the car and they're getting ready to hoist it up out of the water. And you can see all the kids in the background watching the car come up out of the quarry. This was very exciting, I'm sure, for them. And here it is up out of the quarry, a little worse for wear. It's got some damage on the right side. And there's also a New York license plate on here. So maybe the guy didn't know where to park at the quarry. That's why it ended up going in the quarry. This Redstone Lake was run by a Mr. Marcoux at this time. Later on, Mr. Linder operated the swimming 
hole there. This is a 1946 photo taken at Redstone Lake. Now it's owned by the Lindner family. This gentleman's doing a, a dive off the high dive tower. The water is no more than 15 feet deep where he's diving into. This is a photo of the new diving tower at Redstone Lake built by Mr. Linder and Donald Heenan. On the left is the concession stand. This is a 1958 photo of people swimming at the local Redstone Lake. The diving boards were provided by Red Silva from Springfield College. So they always had a supply of fantastic boards there. This is taken July 5th, 1959. You can see dozens of people enjoying swimming at the Redstone Lake. They had a riding stable at Four Corners and a lot of people used to take their horses up behind Blackman's Pond and come here that way. In 1965, they began draining Redstone Lake. They were going to open a new quarry a few hundred yards away. So these photos will show you the quarry being drained. This is a photo of Lindner's house in the background. And you can see that the bed of stone there is not very good. This particular end of the quarry didn't have a high quality stone. Here it is bone dry. On the very top you can see one of the diving boards and it certainly isn't overly deep at that particular time. I'm sure people hit their head on rocks all the time there and more than one person I know drowned in this particular quarry. This photo here you're looking at what's called a well point. It's the lowest point in the quarry any of the groundwater that came into the quarry would run off into this area and be collected there and, and then pumped out on a daily basis. This is a photo of the well point all dried out. I think they quarried this area of stone and then just built this particular area as a collection point. It's a pretty cool feature. And this is the old quarry bed totally exposed now. In the background you can see on the right corner you'll see some bright red dirt there. That's red overburden being taken off from the new quarry location. When they did the borings for this new quarry they determined there was over 14 million cubic feet of stone underground here so that was there was enough stone for years and years and years to to come and at the bottom they found a couple of old cars the car on the left if you can determine where that is in the lighted area that's a 1929 model a ford and just in the shadow on the right is a 1931 Phaeton. These were identified by Mr. Don Heenan, who's got to be an expert because I couldn't tell you one from another. That car that came out of the quarry a few photos ago had a couple legends associated with it while it was underwater. One that there was a diamond ring in the back seat and another one that there was a body in the trunk. But when they brought the car up, you know, they found out they were just rumors, but these are these cars in this photo would probably be just field cars that kids just pitched over the edge and they would never have gotten taken out if they didn't drain this quarry to reuse reopen it again. This is a fantastic picture of the quarry all drained out. It's now underwater again, but at the bottom here you can see they finally got into a good bed of stone here. It's pretty much all lousy looking stone. 
till they got way down there. That, that was almost 100 feet deep by the time they got down there to where they needed to go. And you could see a pile of overburden in the background. They had to drain the old quarry to see which direction the stone was going in so they could you know, determine how to mine the new bed properly. And now we're in the new quarry that's a few hundred yards from where the old quarry was. You can see they're in a fantastic bed of stone here. I think they took about 20 feet of overburden off the top to get to this stone. And the gentleman on the right corner is Bob Anwood. He's on a steam drill. He's drilling holes vertically and then they'll be taken off horizontally later on. <clears throat> There's this steam shovel operator in the bottom taking the blocks out and loading them up. They used tank carriers to get the stone down to the rock yard on Maple Street. And here is the 1965 newspaper clipping of the f blocks that were headed for New York University. Mr. Chaporis had a, a big order for stone for the university, so they just sent a reporter down there and took a photo of it. This is the quarry around 1971, out of business and filled with water. The silica from the groundwater was pumped into the brook that runs across Elm and Cooley, and it turned the water kind of a blood red and the neighbors complained that it was causing environmental damage so they had to shut down the operations. They, they didn't want to put up a filtration plant. It would have been you know, very costly to do so Mr. Chaporis shut down the operation and it filled up with water. This is a photo in the 1960s taken at the McCormick Longmeadow Brownstone Company at 41 Maple Street, not, which now where Pioneer Gymnastics is located. These gentlemen are running brownstone through a rock planer. In 1970, one of the workers went through the planer, which was a pretty gruesome death at the time. This photo is an Indian worker from Canada sawing the rock with a water-powered wire saw. You can see this, the saw blade and the water coming out the bottom. They were able to use the wire saw to cut the blocks to any thickness they wanted to. These are 1960s photos of the water-cooled saws at the McCormick Longmeadow Stone Company. They were diamond-tipped circular saws and they were able to cut the slabs of brownstone to various um, thicknesses. This photo here shows some of the different textures that the McCormick Longmeadow Stone Company could put on the stone. They offered crandled, shot sawn, tooled, or split faced. The crandled stone is made from the Worcester stone. It's very light brown. And the middle two are from the Maynard quarry, the reddish color, and the bottom split-faced one is made from the Worcester stone. This is a 1959 photo of the steel derrick at the McCormick's quarry. That's what we called it. Mr. McCormick owned it at the time. It's still the same Worcester quarry, just with a new name. The mast and boom are fabricated from steel. All the older ones were wooden. The kids used to get in trouble once in a while. They'd climb up there to the top of the mast and put their initials up, up on top here. And when the guy would come to grease the cables, he'd see the initials and get a little peeved off that someone had been up there and wanted to know who who the culprit was, but I don't think anyone ever fessed up. This photo was taken in the winter of 1963 by Frank Lacey. 
He was a police officer in town who also was the town photographer at the time. The shows of steel Derek in operation in the same 1963 photo. They're loading stone onto the bed, getting ready to go down to the plant on Maple Street. This is in the winter time. And now the stone is loaded onto the truck, getting ready to take off to the plant. There's a huge pile of overburden in the background they had to get rid of to get to the stone down below. The house in the right corner was the Wheeler house at the time. It was right on Route 83, just up from the DPW. They condemned the house because it was too near the edge of the quarry and they moved out and they tore the house down. That's right where the last phase of Brownstone Gardens is now, right on that same edge of the quarry. And it's all underwater right now. This team of workers is drilling vertical holes to crack the stone. You can, right, just beyond where this gentleman is standing, you can already see a crack in the stone. There, that was their objective, just to make an initial crack in the stones. And these gentlemen are down below putting the, they're called pins and feathers. And they would drive a series of these metal wedges into the stone to split the stone horizontally. The gentleman with the sledgehammer is Coley Brown. He was the foreman. And the other two gentlemen are Arthur Butler and Michael Sears. They're standing in an old truck bed suspended by the steam shovel. This photo shows two brothers, Antonio and Luigi LaRocca, standing on top of the big bed of stone. They had just drilled the, the holes vertically and the gentleman down below split it horizontally and now they're prying it out of the bed to get it ready to be lifted up and taken out of the quarry itself. This is a beautiful brownstone memorial mantle in Ames Library in Northeastern Mass. It's designed by St. Gaudens, who also designed the $20 gold piece. It's built of the Worcester sandstone, the real light brown colored. It's just a fantastic um, carving. It's still there if you want to go visit it. And this mantle is in the Billings Library at the University of Vermont. This is built of the Kibbe redstone. This is the first major project built by the Norcross brothers. It's Trinity Church in Boston, Mass. It was designed by H.H. H. Richardson. The contract was signed in October of 1873, and it was built for $435,000. It was completed in November of 1876. It was built of Worcester and Kibbe sandstone and Dedham and Westerly granites. This is a photo of the Galilee porch at Trinity Church and it just shows some of the intricate carving that they did there. These next photos are more modern photos of the Trinity Church that are in color and one of them is a beautiful close-up of some of the carvings of the religious figures there. They're full-size carvings. I'm not sure if they carved them on site or they carved them and shipped them down there. It's just kind of mind-boggling the detail these stone carvers were able to put into this sandstone. Just beautiful, beautiful work. This photo is of Trinity Church in New York. It's the new south wing on the church. It was built by McCormick Longmeadow Stone Company and made of Worcester stone. That's the 
right next to the police station. It's a beautiful light colored stone. The second photo is a more modern photo of the same wing on the church. The stone is aged quite a bit. And it, it's not quite as colorful as it was when it was first put up. The soot and stuff in the air is just kind of discolored a little bit, but it's a beautiful example of the stone from East Song Meadow being used. This beautiful color photo is South Congregational Church on 50 Maple Street in Springfield, also designed by H.H. H. Richardson, and it was dedicated in 1875. The total cost of this church, including the land, was $145,000. Just a magnificent church. This photo is of the Richardson Library in New Orleans, designed by master architect Henry Hobson Richardson. He had passed away by the time this library was built. They used a design from a library in Michigan that he had designed and transferred it to this particular library. He was born in New Orleans, so that's why they built it here. It started out as a library and then was converted to a radio station and then to an office building and now has recently been restored back to a library. Richardson did six libraries in the Romanesque style and this is the only southern one. He, it was built in 1887 from East Long Meadow, Brownstone. And here's a couple pictures of the arches in the front of the building you can just see the intricate carving that they did on the stone. It's magnificent carving. And this last color photo shows the reading room in the library. This was all painted as it became other uses other than the library and they recently took all this apart and took it out and stripped all the paint off it and put it back together. But you can just see this magnificent mantle in the background. And that looks like it's all made of Worcester sandstone. Beautiful light colored. But if you're ever down in New Orleans, look up this library. It's just a fantastic piece of architecture. And we're glad they used East Song Meadow Stone to do it. These are some of the uses for brownstone that they used. The first one is a boot scraper for cleaning the mud off your shoes. And the second one is a beautiful brown stone bench made by master stone carver Napoleon White. He lived on White Street and they named the street after his family. The top left is a bird bath made by Napoleon White. It's still there on the beginning of White Street if you want to see it. On the right is a beautiful brownstone monument at Greenlawn Cemetery. That was one of the first uses of the stone in town here. They used, it was easily carved and they used it quite extensively to make gravestones. They also used the stone to make foundations for building as it was very easily carved and came out of the ground in nice blocks. The urn on the bottom is on the corner of Calendar Avenue and Summers Road. It's on Mrs. Skiffington's property. It's a beautiful, beautiful carving of redstone. She puts flowers in there in the spring. You can see that as you drive down Summers Road going down the hill. This is a grave marker for a Civil War veteran. The symbol on the left is for the 7th Cavalry, and the symbol on the right is for the 12th Cavalry. It was found upside down on a property at 240 Kibbe Road and had been used as the bottom step to get up to a porch that was there. They unearthed it when they were renovating the property and flipped it over and discovered what was on the other side. Possibly the right side got broken during making the stone and that was why they discarded the stone there was some reason why they didn't put this stone you know in the in a graveyard to honor the civil war veteran 
you know, something happened to it along the way. But it's a beautiful piece that's been unearthed in town. So keep digging in your yard and maybe you'll unearth a treasure like that. This is a photo of the 240-acre brownstone quarry in Medina, New York that was leased by the Chiporis family. The stone here was used at the People's Bank at Four Corners. It's very similar to East Song Meadow brownstone and we were thrilled that the old gas station was torn down and a People's Bank was put up there that incorporated the brownstone into the use in the bank that normally people's bank wouldn't go to these lengths to make a bank look so authentic as the character of the town but we're thankful that they did do that this is the only known example of a sample of stone offered by james and mara it's located in the springfield museum of natural history at downtown springfield and the salesman would have brought this around and offered it to different people to show what they offered for the textures and color of their stone. These last few pictures are just some of the quarries in town or what's left of them. There was a dump on Kibbe Road that was started in the 40s as a dump and a gentleman named Clarence used to run that one when I was younger but it's now completely filled up and capped over and in the back of the quarry is this huge pile of overburden. This is probably a good 25-30 feet tall and this was stuff they took off the top of the ground to get to the stone to begin with. This is John Romito's quarry on Kibbe Road. It's only about a hundred yards further towards Summers Road from where we just were. There's only a, about a hundred foot land bridge between the two quarries. This is taken on the power companies right away. Yeah, this quarry was worked to almost a hundred feet deep and it's just a beautiful quarry that fortunately never became a dump. This is another view of the same quarry the town hall and the armory fence foundation were made with stone from this quarry here. This is the Moody Quarry in wintertime. It's off of Elm Street Extension or you can get to it at the end of Greenacre Lane. It was a swimming hole for many years. I probed it in the winter and it was 18 to 20 feet deep. In 1935 a gentleman named Lazario Stellato, who was 24, drowned in this quarry. From what I gather, he had gotten heated up at work and just jumped into the water and apparently just suffered a heart attack from the cold water. But it's unfortunate, but that happened quite a bit in town here. It's quite small at this time because neighbors from all side keep dumping their lawn clippings and leaves right up to the edge of the quarry so each year it gets a little smaller. This is the Worcester quarry filled with water where Brownstone Gardens is located. Here's another view of the Worcester quarry this was shut down around 1969 or 70. This is the remains of a Swedish gentleman named Carlos Lindstrom. He had three quarries off of Dell Street or you could get to them off of Rankin Avenue. The DPW filled two of them in when they were um, clearing Elm Street they filled them in with stumps and stuff and this is the only small hole that remains at this time. This is the Billings Quarry on Summers Road now owned by Danny Burek across from the police station. It used to be the Nathaniel Goodrich Quarry 
the S.J. Billings and Company quarry, the James and Mara quarry, the Keatings quarry, and now it's Burex quarry. They had a garden show in the 1990s, I think it was, at their house, and Danny got the fountain work in there, so we got a beautiful picture. It's right off the diving board at his property. In July 10th, 1934, uh, a gentleman named Leonard Clark drowned here. He was swimming across the quarry and just wasn't able to make it. And they pulled him out with grappling hooks. And many of the parents in town made their children watch him being taken out because they didn't want him swimming in this quarry to begin with. They called it the big quarry at the time, and it was a very popular swimming hole, but the parents were just trying to make them aware of the dangers of swimming in a quarry like that. But it was an unfortunate tragedy. This is a 1987 photo of the Herman King Quarry. You can access it off of Elm Street or North Circle. That's it. my son in the photo foreground here. When they did some work on Orchard Road, they clear cut completely around this quarry, so now it looks just like a glorified pond. But at least we have a picture of it when it what it used to look like. This is the remains of the McGregory quarry off of South Bend Lane. Also you can get to it off of Ronald Avenue. There was actually three quarry holes on this site, and Mr. Goldstein filled them all in. And what you're looking at now is just the spring runoff that is filled in the bottom of the hole. It, it kind of looks like a quarry, but the actual holes are filled in. That was one of the oldest quarries in town. And this is the final photo, the famous pier at Pine Quarry. This was taken in 2000. It was one of the two quarries at the Pine Quarry. One was owned by James and Mara, and this one was run by the Norcross brothers. This is all on conservation land. Uh, Don Mackey did a video of this a while ago. You can find that once in a while on LCAT. And it's, it's also an area you can go out on your own and go see what's out there the remains of the old quarry. It's a wonderful place to go visit and we hope you go see that. We're giving tours out there if you'd like it. You can just contact the Historical Commission and you can come visit our museum down on Maple Street. We're open the third Saturday of each month from 1 to 3. Thank you very much.